again. I know everybody said that, but it's, it is good to be here. Um, I do have one video we will be trying to play through the session, so if it doesn't work, you're going to have to forgive me. I'm letting you know now, preempting potential technical issues that we might have. So I've got basically 25 minutes. So we're going to be talking about five different use cases for AI that I've actually implemented with uh, my company at Away Group with five different customers. And we're going to look at, I guess, how it applies. What I'm hoping that we get out of the session is that AI is cool. Uh, whenever we talk about AI, or when I'm saying it in the session, it is a bit of a marketing buzzword still. So when I'm referring to AI, I'm talking about data science, machine learning, AI, advanced analytics, kind of all of these use cases bundled up into that one term. So I'm going to be sharing five different use cases. Um, and this first one I'll start off with is one that we worked with with Microsoft Research on. So in the world today, or on the globe, or around the globe, there's a whole bunch of satellites circling the Earth. And these satellites have a whole bunch of different functions. And some of them we actually use for capturing images. Now, a lot of these images, they turn up on things like uh, Azure Maps, Google Maps, uh, a lot of the navigation tools that we're using. A lot of different industries use them for real estate, for agriculture, and a bunch of different things. But the one problem we face in all of these use cases with all this imaging is that it turns out 80% of the world is actually covered by clouds. And cameras can't really see through clouds very well. So the first example I really wanted to share about AI was a model that can actually see through clouds. It's the ability to actually take in an image that looks like this, it's a fairly, uh, fairly cloudy day in Washington, in the US, and the ability to turn it into an image like this. And that's pretty incredible, being able to see the detail that we can actually extract from that. And if you really put a bunch of filters on this, this even looks a little bit blurry if you look at it um, up close. So one of the amazing things here is the ability for us to actually uh, create or introduce or bring back detail uh, that may have been lost. Now, while I'm talking about this in the context of satellite images, this applies in many different areas. Um, for example, uh, being able to take old uh, photos, old scans of art, being able to make them better resolution. I don't know if you've seen on YouTube, there's some pretty cool videos where they've taken footage from the 19, early 1900s, and they've run AI on it, made it 4K, made it 60 FPS, it's super smooth. They didn't have cameras like that back then. But it gives us some really it gives new life to a lot of this content. So another example here. Um, this is an image which is fairly blurry. It's taken from, um, again, another satellite. And so there's a technique in AI that we call super resolution. It's the ability to take an image that um, is maybe a, a low res and being able to extrapolate what that image should look like to make it more detailed and more interesting. And so this is kind of the result here. Some people, some naysayers might say that just looks like sharpening. Um, initially, <laughs> kind of looks like that. But once you actually start to add additional types of color, we're using RGB here, that when you look at hyperspectral imaging and actually going to see into the soil, we've actually got use cases where we can look at the amount of water that is contained in the soil through clouds from space. Like, how cool is that? So we've got an example here. This is taking that one step further. And so uh, Microsoft uh, and us, Microsoft Research and us working together, uh, we've developed a model that can basically take maybe three sensors in a field. So instead of investing in potentially hundreds or thousands of sensors, which could be expensive, connectivity is a problem often in rural use cases, we can put just three in a field. And that gives us the ground truth, the literal ground truth of the state of that field. And then if we combine that with imaging from space, looking through the clouds, adding super resolution to actually get higher detail, we can actually use a machine learning model or an AI model to infer the spread of moisture, even though we only had three sensors in the ground. So this is this is an agriculture-focused example here. But basically, this field, the farmer can see quite clearly which areas have high density of, of moisture, which in this case is not much. But we can also see particularly dry areas in that field as well, those red, um, red sections. So that's our first use case. It's about being able to enhance extract additional context and additional value from images that we already have. Um, we're seeing this across medical imaging and tons of other image sources as well. The second use case is a bit more of a fun one. Um, what we're seeing here is a lawn bowls game. 
uh, last year, pretty much, I'd say 11 months ago, a web group worked with Ryman Healthcare, who are an aged care provider, to design an Olympics for aged care uh, residents. Now, these were people who may have been affected by COVID because they were locked down inside their villages and they weren't able to see their family. And so we designed an Olympic event that allowed people to basically compete remotely. So one of the events was a, a lawn bowls game. We needed a way for us to be able to have uh, one team playing in, let's say, Christchurch, uh, playing lawn bowls on their physical lawn bowl green. And they needed to be able to play a team in Melbourne. And so there needed to be some kind of digital link to connect these together. And this is where we used some, uh, some additional AI concepts here. So what you're seeing here is an early development um, shot, a bit of a screen recording I've got here. It's our office on the left-hand side. We've got two um, bowl greens. This is essentially two different locations. Um, and the image on the right is essentially the AI having normalized. It's found where the, the bowling green is. It's found where the balls are. And it's kind of lined them up to figure out are the balls actually in the same place. Um, I do have a really quick one minute summary video. This is the one that we'll see if it actually the audio plays. If not, I'll have to narrate it. The Lawn, the Lawn Bowls, Bowls final, final was the world's, world's first, first remote, remote bowls, bowls tournament, tournament using, using artificial, artificial intelligence. intelligence. The, game the game was played was virtually, virtually between two teams, teams across, across two, two greens, greens, one in one Hamilton, Hamilton and one in Christchurch. Christchurch. Overhead cameras, cameras were set up in both locations, locations with, with video, video streaming linking both greens together in real time. AI technology mapped bowl positions onto hollow lens mixed reality headsets worn by aware officials. I can actually see both of these in my monitors. When I put this down, I can see where the rules are in both locations. This enabled them to lock in precise gameplay on the opposing team's green. Both, Both teams, teams and their supporters, and supporters were shown the same feed on big screens. screens. And it's going to go under the head, and you've got your winners. There they are. The Hilda Ross Club have come from 3-0 behind. The response, the response to the inaugural virtual, virtual bowls event was hugely positive. Mm. One must stay in the MC. It really is so, so interesting. This is fantastic. Give it a couple of years, and we'll have drones flying around putting the balls in <laughs> He's not wrong. So the first uh, the first version of this event, we had HoloLens headsets on, with one person on each side. The AI was transmitting positioning of the balls, and we could actually place them in the right place. So one, one team would take a turn in one area, another team would take a turn in the other location. Um, since this event, we actually have started developing a robot that can actually do the ball placement. So that's kind of the next evolution of this. But I guess with this example of AI, I really wanted to demonstrate that a lot of the things that we're using today, a lot of the services, the tools, the apps, a lot of them already have AI in them right now. We don't even know. It's silent. But the idea is that it enables us to connect with others, to filter data, or to do more. All right, traffic. Let's talk about traffic for a little bit. So this is not AI. Uh, this is actually technology. This is tools that are being used by city councils right now. Uh, to manage traffic lights. So and it's an interface that looks like it's from, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, but it works, it's functional, and it does a good job of actually managing the state of the traffic lights, the traffic network in a, in a given city. We were given a task to find a way to extract the data from these, these platforms, combine it all together, using tools like Azure Synapse and Power BI, um, to actually provide a much more modern clean view of this and actually bring in other data sources that we didn't expect. What if we could combine the state of traffic lights with the potential breakdowns with weather information? What if we could predict in advance when a, a traffic light might fail because of certain conditions? So that was the kind of thing that we were looking forward to, to solving. So the first thing we did was we built a device. Uh, this is actually a solar powered camera. Um, and this is an example of what we would call edge AI. It's the ability to train a machine learning model, an AI model, pick that up and run it offline or run it on a device that's kind of lower power, closer to the source of data it's collecting. So an example of this, we have these bolted up on street lamps. All, well, there are a few around the country here in New Zealand and a couple in Australia as well. And they're actually using the camera not to identify people or identify cars, but we want to understand the use of those spaces. So how many traffic, how many cars are actually flying at any given time? Can we measure the speed? Can we determine whether they're actually commercial versus um, consumer vehicles, things like that. And so the idea here is that we, we train this machine learning model, 
It's running on this device, completely isolated on its own, and it's pushing that data up to the cloud for consumption. This is a bit of a view of what one of those cameras has actually seen. So you can see here, this is looking at a footpath. And I don't know if you, if you know that, but when Lime scooters turned up, they basically had this real <coughs> stealth method to get their vehicles in the city. What they did was overnight, they went and dropped them all over the city, and they didn't ask for permission from the councils. It just kind of happened, and it caught on kind of a viral uh, kind of situation. The councils were taken aback a little bit, a little bit surprised. So <clears throat> what they wanted to understand was, can we use some type of sensor? It could be a physical sensor. It could be a camera with AI. But can we use some kind of sensor to understand how many scooters are there in the city? Where are they right now? Uh, if there are accidents, where are the accidents happening? And so this is an example of us being able to, again, use the AI to, to get better situational awareness, to understand what's going on. So if we combine this all together, we take the traffic light data from that super old ancient system. We take weather information. We take uh, information about of data from the sewers to understand how full they are. We take information about traffic volumes and traffic flow. And suddenly we get something that looks more like this, more of a modern web app that, that the cities can actually use to understand the state of traffic, uh, drive times, uh, closed roads. But also now we have a data set that we can predict traffic events before they actually happen. We can predict when road assets will fail before they'll happen. And so this is really, um, I guess, an example of where there's probably five or six different areas where AI has actually applied uh, to build the solution. But it's bringing all the data together to actually understand what's going on. This particular screen I'm showing right now, you can see here it's actually measuring the volume of, of cycles going past that particular point. So at, in no way are we revealing the identity of these people. It's completely anonymous. We just want to know what time and what place that bike or that scooter was seen. And that information is super helpful and uh, informs, I guess, the way that cities are now developing their roads and services. All right, robots. Let's talk robots. So um, has anyone heard of FarmBot before? It's, uh, it's been online uh, as an open source project for probably the last two years, I'd say. And FarmBot is basically a kit that you put together, and it can manage and water and uh, weed and plant your garden for you. So this is another example of Edge AI with IoT, where we've got a connected robot sitting in a field, in your backyard, in a shipping container, wherever you want. And on the web app, you basically have a bird's eye view like this, where you drag and drop the plants you want. And then the robot does everything else for you. It'll pick up the seeds. It'll drop them into the soil. It'll water them occasionally. You can see these are all well watered. But the great thing here is that we're actually being very deliberate about water consumption. So from a sustainability point of view, you know, it's good to take care of all of the soil, but we can focus the water distribution specifically around where the plants actually are. So now we can be much more efficient, much more effective with the water that we have. Other examples of robots. This is one of our robots in our office. His name is Spot. Um, this was his birthday party that we had. <laughs> Spot is an incredibly complex robot and machine. If you've seen him on YouTube, he's done a lot of dances and, and acting and things like that. We tend to take him to customers and put him in dangerous situations where you wouldn't put people. And what's really interesting to me is that robotics opens up a whole new opportunity around where AI can actually go. Before, AI would be this thing that runs online. It's a web service that you consume. But with Spot, Spot can walk into a field, can measure the height of the grass, can go and look for bears if we're in somewhere in North America, and it can do all these things all in one, one unit and then walk back to home base when he needs to charge. If he falls over, he can get back up again. So if we combine a bunch of these concepts that I've talked about um, today, I'm going to keep my talk short, so we're almost at the end. If we take Spot, this robot that has AI built into it that can understand how to walk and how to recover itself and how to navigate to certain areas, that's the first level of AI. And then we add our own AI on top of that that turns it into a vineyard robot. Suddenly, Spot can now look for grapes. We can count exactly how many grapes there are. So the farmer will actually know, OK, I know what my yield's going to be. We can actually measure the size of every individual grape to know what time is the best time to harvest those grapes. We can smell the grapes with AI to understand how ripe the grapes are. What if one row of grapes is actually ready to be harvested before the rest for the flavor that we want? So we can get really, really 
deep into the detail of this with these robots. So here's um, an example of that vineyard one was talking about, where this is Spot walking down a row of actual grapes in the vineyard. And Spot is just initially highlighting the grapes that, that he's seeing right now. Now, there's, a, there's actually a bunch of different AI all combined to make this work. But one of the cool things about this is this is actually a, a 4K camera, a 4K video stream that we're pulling off um, in the middle of this field. Now, if we're, a, if we're in a rural situation, you can't get 4K worth of bandwidth times you know, potentially hundreds of cameras. So what if we could use AI at the edge to find the grapes first and just send the grapes and send the rest of the footage when it gets back to base? So this means the farmer can get an immediate count of the grapes. They can do a bit of quality control and look at the <coughs> images. And then it means that when the, when the robot gets back to base, we can do the more hardcore analysis of, we have a model that looks at every single leaf on the plant, it looks for disease. So that's not really feasible live as we walk down the road, but when it comes back to base, definitely feasible. The second example here is uh, we took Spot into the Christchurch Cathedral. This was the first time that uh, a land-based robot went inside the cathedral um, since they started the renovations. You can see him walking around in quite a deep pile of uh, pigeon poop. Uh, unfortunately, there was quite a lot of damage, but in this particular case, we actually had a, a 3D LiDAR scanner on the back. And so we were mapping the inside of the cathedral so that they can actually plan out the renovation and the recovery efforts for the for the building. And so this is probably the most practical example of a robot carrying AI into a location in a place where people can't go. And so uh, I find that super interesting myself. So that's actually all the slides I had to show. I just wanted to quickly go through five um, examples of how we're using AI today. And I'll open up the questions. Uh, well, so I'm um, guessing you guys actually writing your all the AI models for yourself, not using Microsoft, uh, the one that showed us. Oh, yeah. So. yeah, yeah. So the question was, are we building our own models or are we using existing off-the-shelf mm -hmm. stuff? So a bit of, bit of a mix. The open source community in the data science world is actually amazing. There's so much amazing development happening every day. We'll train a model and we're like 95% accurate. We're delivering a huge amount of value to the customer. And then the next day, a new model framework comes out and it's 96% accurate. And you're like, oh, okay, we're going to start again. So it is a bit of both. We have a bit of our own commercial IP around how you optimize models to run them on AI, on like edge hardware, on IoT hardware. I think that's probably where most of the IP is. We can train specific models, but a lot of companies can do that. So we focus more on how do you actually take that and commercialize it, integrate it into an API or build it into a business process. 